Welcome to our next video for GCSE Psychology. This is for um, OCR, GCSE Psychology. We are on the Psychological Problems section and today's video is going to have a look at two theories of schizophrenia. The first thing we need to do is we need to understand what schizophrenia is. It's a uh, mental condition that is talked about quite a lot but we find that there are lots of symptoms that get mixed up with, say, with schizophrenia and you need to be sure that you can uh, confidently say what some of the symptoms of schizophrenia are um, so you don't get modelled up with different mental illnesses. So the clinical characteristics, so these are the characteristics that the doctor will use to diagnose you. There are two types of symptoms for schizophrenia. There are positive symptoms and negative symptoms. So positive symptoms, I want you to think of these as kind of extra things on top of what a uh, normal, in inverted commas, person would have. Negative symptoms are symptoms that are missing. So things that people with schizophrenia don't have. So for example, it may be that they um, appear emotionless that they fit, they look like there's some of those emotions missing, that they're very sort of flat. Positive symptoms, like we said, are the extra bits. And these are things like hallucinations or delusions, um, extra thoughts that schizophrenic sufferers have. Now, the ICD manual, which is a manual that mental health professionals will use to diagnose mental illness, has a big, long list of symptoms. Now, as you can see on the board, they're very lengthy. There are lots of symptoms and we need at least one from the left column and or two from the right hand column. But what we're after is these symptoms of thought echoes or thought insertions where people feel like there's thoughts being placed inside their head, delusions um, where they uh, believe things aren't real or that there's uh, people controlling parts of their body. Hallucin hallucinatory voices so they can hear voices that aren't there or um, they can see things that aren't there and then we've probably got some of those negative symptoms that we talked about before where there's uh, flat emotional responses um, or quite catatonic behavior so people are not moving very much they're quite sort of still and, and uh, not uh, engaged in uh, society at all if we break that down, this is what it looks like. So we want one of the ones on the left hand side, thought echo or broadcasting when you feel like your thoughts are uh, broadcast to people, other people can read your thoughts. Delusions of control, hallucinating voices or other delusions. And two of the, um, the right hand column. So persistent hallucinations of other sorts. And when we say persistent, this has got to be every day for about four weeks or so. Disrupted train of thought, so you can't keep a thought process in your head. Thoughts are jumping from one place to another, and speech probably is something similar. This catatonic behaviour of last lack of movement and engagement, and these blunt emotional responses. We have two theories that we need to look at in terms of explaining where schizophrenia might come from. The first one, first one is called social drift theory. Now, this is uh, a theory that tries to explain how society might be the cause of people getting schizophrenia. So it tries to have a look at what the relationship with the person with schizophrenia is and um, how they fit into, so into society. And specifically, it suggests that there is a particular social class, that the lower classes are much more inclined to get schizophrenia. And we do know that working class people are more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. But we also know that that might be an issue with how we diagnose rather than the more people have it. That perhaps the higher classes are either not getting diagnosed as much as working class or because they're having illness, uh, the difficulties with the illness, they are moving from middle or upper class down to working class. So perhaps they used to be middle or upper class, but because they're really struggling, then they're now working class. And that might be a, a different cause. Uh, sorry, that might be a different explanation. 
Now we do know that when people are diagnosed with schizophrenia, they do tend to lose touch with reality and they stop taking part in things that would be classed as normal involvement in society. So they may drop out of education, they may drop out of some training or uh, apprenticeship or university. They may drop out of employment if they're working, they might find it hard to go to jobs so they just don't go anymore or they lose their jobs because their behaviour is so erratic. And they're not motivated by their income anymore. So in society we're all motivated by income in terms of we want to earn some money because we want to buy nice things with that money. Now whether that's just buying new clothes or a new car or whether it's bigger things like making sure the mortgage is paid or saving up for holidays. We know that when people have schizophrenia, that actually those kind of logical thought processes don't seem to be so important. So that motivation to do things to earn money is not there anymore. So this has a major impact on how people can function in society. And it becomes very circular in terms of the problems that they have with their behaviour and the problems that leads to. And what you tend to find is that people with schizophrenia drop out of those normal functions. That means that they feel very rejected by society, so they choose to disengage from society. And then the more they disengage, the more they drop out and step back from society, and the more they feel they're rejected. So you can see this kind of is going round and round in this circle. Now it may be that they, be, they are losing their jobs because they're off work ill. It may be that actually the job is becoming too difficult to manage with all these additional symptoms. Maybe the medication's having an impact. Schizophrenia medication is, is quite heavy stuff. That could be having an impact on how somebody manages their everyday life. But it could also be the stigma of mental illness. If somebody is diagnosed with schizophrenia and goes and tells their boss at work, Unfortunately, in some situations, this may mean that that person doesn't want a schizophrenic person working for them anymore, and that might lead to rejection and disengagement. Our second theory is a biological theory. Now, there's quite a few bits of, of neuropsychology that crop up in the OCR course, so you need to be thinking about how this brain function might be different and how that might be able to explain schizophrenia. And we do know from looking at brain scans, and we've got some on the screen here, that people with schizophrenia's brain works slightly differently, or it appears to work slightly differently when we scan it. Though that might be because there are different thought processes going on, or it may be that the chemicals are different in certain areas of the brain, which mean that some areas aren't as effective as they should be. And that can then have an impact, or that can explain where some of these symptoms might come from. Now some of these ideas can get actually quite complicated so what I've tried to do is just reduce this down to the key points for you so you can start to get your head around what might be different in a, the brain of someone who's suffering from schizophrenia. So the suggestion is that there's too much dopamine in the wrong areas of the brain. Now dopamine is a neurotransmitter, its job is to take messages around the brain and to make sure the brain functions properly. The neurotransmitters have very specific jobs, so we have different neurotransmitters for different roles within the brain. Now, dopamine is um, linked to perception, so how we see the world and how we hear the world, how we pay attention to the world, uh, and also regulating our mood. Now, you can already see how this might be linked to schizophrenia, because what we've talked about there actually links really well with some of the symptoms that we mentioned at the start. So too much dopamine in the middle of the brain might mean that movements are erratic and it might be that we see this disjointed uh, movements or these catatonic behaviours. And also it might be linked to delusions and hallucinations. So if the area of the brain that deals with uh, regulating what we hear and what we see has too much dopamine in it, maybe it's seeing too much and hearing too much and some of those things are not actually there. Or maybe they are not... Uh, managed properly and we can imagine we can hear things or see things that aren't there. At this point you may need to just remind yourself about neurotransmitters and how they move around the body so you should be aware of the process of synaptic transmission and how 
um, the cells and the neurons pass messages on to each other. And it's really important that you can explain that in the exam and you can explain this process of synaptic transmission where neurotransmitters like dopamine are released from the axon terminals of one cell when it reaches action potential and passes that synaptic cleft or the synaptic gap into the next receiving neuron and the message gets passed on around the brain that way. So when we compare these brains then and we have a look at what might be different between them, we are looking for areas where we can find links to those symptoms we talked about right at the start. So for example, people with schizophrenia seem to have less blood flow in their prefrontal cortex. Now this is the part of the brain that's just behind your forehead and it's really important for things like making decisions and problem solving. So if you've got less blood flow in that area of your brain, it means that you're not going to make those decisions effectively or you're not going to be as good at problem solving. And we can link that to schizophrenia in terms of regulation of your own behaviour and making decisions about whether these hallucinations are real or not. We also see differences in the hippocampus. Now this is right in the centre of the brain, it's a really old area of the brain and it's used for memories and emotions and it's much smaller in people with schizophrenia. And it may be that this is the reason why there's a lack of regulation about emotion or there's that emotional flatness that we see. The other thing that we see is different is the temporal lobe. This is the part that runs down the side of your brain and is just behind your temple. It's really important for things like speech and language. So if that's smaller, then maybe we, that would explain why we have this disjointed language um, and the speech looks like it's uh, all over the place and very disjointed. Okay, so we've had a look at two different theories. Uh, as you can tell, they're very, very different theories. One is based on how you interact with society and about how you choose to behave. The other one is about the biology that we have. And the suggestion might be that we have that biology from birth. So it might be a suggestion that um, you may have this predisposition for schizophrenia uh, and there might not be anything you can do about it. So these theories fit really well with our ideas of, of nature and nurture and free will and determinism. So you need to know both, so make sure you've got a good explanation of both. And then you'll also need to know the study that supports this. So this is the Daniel study and this supports the dopamine hypothesis. So the study just supports one of our theories. Thanks very much. I hope you found that useful. See you again soon.